YouTube is Brad Phillips. Look at what we've got here. This super dinky little box right here. Oh, we're gonna unbox this thing right now. You already know what it is. You can see the thumbnails, but we are in the process of opening it nonetheless. Now, you may have noticed that we've done this plane a couple times already, and this is gonna be, it's our third time doing this exact plane. Oh, is it really? I think it might be. Oh, I know it's the second, but, ooh, might be the third. But anyway, there's something about having just an amazing, oh yes, an amazing beaver. <laughs> <laughs> it's got so the Reflex V2 as well, yeah. which is really nice. So technically it is different for us because it's got the Reflex V2. Of course, that's a stabilizer and that's made and branded by FMS. And so it comes in their aircraft most of the time. But you do have to check when you're ordering, it doesn't come in every single plane, but most planes like this J11, for instance, does not come with the Reflex V2. And honestly, there's a few exceptions to where I would like to have my own stabilizer, and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. But then we've done other planes for FMS of late that were smaller, and you guys will see this coming up where they didn't have a Reflex V2, and we were sort of taken back by that because we didn't, we didn't think it made sense that they wouldn't have a Reflex installed by default. So just make sure you're checking when you're following our links to buy those to help support us. All right, so this is the V2. The only difference that I know of is basically the fact that it's got the reflex in it, but I could be mistaken. I know that it was an amazing experience before. There are optional floats for this thing. Obviously the Beaver is a very large plane in real life. And of course, it's known to be a float plane, I think generally speaking, uh, but it does come equipped with regular fixed landing gear in this package. It has a huge wingspan of two meters and I'm six foot something and we'll show you when I'm all done putting it together and it is just a beautiful plane. I love the way it looks. I love the way it flies. And yes, this could be considered a trainer, but I wouldn't necessarily suggest huge planes for beginners unless you're coming back to the hobby and you're from the era where, mm -hmm. you know, big was normal for a starter plane. I just suggest that because you can get away with a lot cheaper batteries. If you wanna get a beginner plane, you could go as small as like one meter and still have a really good experience. But that being said, this thing is second to none in that regard. And let's go ahead and unbox it right now. So here we go, guys. If you wanna help support us as we unbox, build, and radio set up these planes, check the links in the video description below. You can find the links to the plane, the battery, our receiver or receiver choices that we recommend. And then of course you can buy those things there and help support us. All right, so as you can see, this is an FMS, so it's packaged well. I wanna point out over here on this corner, the wheel is exposed, rock hard wheel. That is one issue with this plane that we've seen on a lot of big planes, and that is not unusual is that they really need a pneumatic tire to make them everything they can be. And so in my opinion, if you're flying on floats, it makes sense that they're not gonna include it because then they're not charging you for something you're not gonna need. But at the end of the day, I think the vast majority of people are gonna be flying from landing gear, even though this is a really cool float plane. So let's go ahead and cut this thing open. Just keep that in mind. If you're buying this, you might wanna consider spending a couple extra bucks and getting a pneumatic tire. We have done that in the past. But again, our previous installs are going to include AS3X and SAFE, as opposed to Reflex, which then doesn't require AS3X and SAFE because the Reflex does both stabilization, which would be artificial three-axis stabilization, AS3X. It would be comparable to that. And then it also does auto leveling, which would be comparable to sensorated flight envelope or SAFE. So if you guys are new to the hobby, just getting back to the hobby, we're gonna help you guys figure out some of the lingo. As you can see, I can't resist taking it out, but look at that tube. That is a huge wing joiner, guys. Now listen, that is definitely not fiberglass. That's carbon fiber, you can tell because it has that high-pitched twang. If that was fiberglass, it would sound dead like plastic. Okay, cool, and then we have this little super dinky prop right here. <laughs> so this is gonna be one of those where you wanna be careful. As we do our install, you may note that I put the prop on at the beginning. 
You don't necessarily have to do that and it won't save you that much time, but just for the sake of our video, that's a 15-9. So that means 15 inches like this, nine inches of penetration for each rotation. So that's pretty cool. We've got a bag of something here, it looks like. It's packed in here. That is quite the nutsack, bolt sack. Ooh, camera crew, if you'd grab my nutsack there, bolt sure. sack. Ooh. And then we also have this USB-A to USB-C for the Reflex V2. Now, I just wanna talk about this cable. We have got a plethora of these cables because we review a lot of planes for FMS and we really have never used them. Now, that being said, there's something a little different about this, so don't think you're gonna get this and use it for the kid's tablet or whatever. Yeah. We have not found them to work for other stuff, so they may have a different pinout than some of the other cables, so just use caution if you decide to use that for some other application. Okay, getting right into the wings. As you can see, absolutely gorgeous finish. We've got the wing strut installed. Look how smooth everything is. We've got obviously the LEDs are protected by this plastic. There are wing tips for nav lights. There are landing lights, one on each wing. And then of course the flaps, huge flaps and ailerons, which are inset, which is super cool. And you can see they are a Fowler flap, so they separate away. Hope I'm saying that right. And same thing with the aileron, which is very unusual. Um, and you can see, cause it's got this Fowler hinge here. So that actually pivots back here instead of pivoting on the leading edge of the wing. So I'm not sure why they do that on some of these. Some of you guys can leave that in the comments for me. And then as you see, we've got this quick disconnect plug, which is pretty cool. So very nice. And that makes it super easy to take this plane apart as compared to some of its counterparts. Um, speaking of possibly like the carbon Z cub, uh, which is one of my favorite planes, by the way. And this is no exception. I really like this plane. Again, carbon fiber, thicker wall on that. This is probably our horizontal stabilizer. And then of course, this is made for the main wing. But you also notice this very thin sidewall. I wonder if they're trying to save a little bit of weight there. Sort of strange. I don't remember that being thin. Mm, Vertical stabilizer. Plastic over the tip here, which is really good because that's a wearing spot. When you push these things in to assemble the planes, a lot of times that crushes. Same thing here, big purchase, plastic and plastic. And then the tailwheel dragger slides into that so you have your steering and ball link on pretty much everything it looks like on this plane, if I recall. And you may notice that there are no servos protruding from the bottom of the wing, which is just an amazing and beautiful feat. About the only thing this plane's not gonna have that some of the other offerings have is thrust reverse. But you can add that if you decide you want to put in an Avian ESC and, an, and a smart receiver. Okay, same thing here. Wings look very symmetrical. Everything looks the same. Beautiful colors. This is all decal here and here. The white and black. Then this is painted red, jigged and painted red. And then look how good the plastic matches the red. Very, very close good. match. I mean, it's not identical, it's but it's dang close. And I gotta say that we have found these manufacturers are getting so good at matching the colors. And that's not something that we had no. just a, a few short years ago. Nope. And just to give you an idea, we don't even have the middle, the middle, the fuselage in here. Look how huge this is. This is just a gigantic plane and it's everything you want if you want a big plane. Now that being said, they're suggesting it as like a trainer. I said this earlier and I'll say it again. I would not necessarily suggest the Beaver as a trainer, but that doesn't mean it's a bad plane or it's hard to fly by any means. It's just more a matter of, it's kind of a big plane. Most people that are flying these things are not gonna fly 6S as a trainer. Right. 6S is expensive for a trainer. Most people don't wanna plop four or 500 bucks on chargers and batteries just to get in the air. So our suggestion is we have a beginner list. We can bring it up whenever you guys want. We re reply to comments all the time with this. As you can see, nice carbon fiber structural support on the wing tip there. This of course is a horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. Big plastic reinforcement here that transfers that load out to this carbon fiber rod here. You can see a little better in the light. Carbon fiber here as well, which is nice. So just a really well thought out design. Nut zerts in plastic. Plastic separates itself way out, makes a huge, huge print. Instead of being this really small place where bolts can go together. So 
Love the design features on these. These things are getting to be where they're just really, really well designed. Now these are gonna go in like that and they've got a little bit of an outline of the fuse. So that's upside down there. Okay, very cool. But just getting back to the whole trainer concept, it's just kind of a bit expensive for a trainer. Well, and I think most people are gonna crash when you're learning and you have less, less involved in fixing. 2000 millimeter Beaver V2, good instruction manuals. We've always been impressed with FMS. They come up with pretty good stuff. These are the new style with 3D renderings as opposed to some of the older ones that had black and white photos. Pictures. Really hard to see mm -hmm. the detail because on those exploded view, uh, technical style drawings, you can always see what you need to see. So just pulling this out, absolutely gorgeous. True to scale and very detailed. So let's go ahead and pull this off and show the people inside of our cabin, which definitely has a bubbled wing, or excuse me, not a bubbled wing, but a bubbled window in this back passenger area, which is so cool because if you were flying this in real life, you could stick your head out that window and look straight down, which is super cool. And then of course you can see all these wires are loose, but what an absolutely gorgeous and cool silhouette of each of the seats. Not overdone, not something crazy, just looks super ultra realistic. And then what we mentioned earlier, we've got the taillight here, lots of plastic where it matters. Plastic here where it's gonna receive the vertical stabilizer. And then of course the steerable tail wheel. Now keep in mind, if you get the float set for this, I believe that you can plug into the bottom of this plane for the steerable water rudder. Yep, it's right there guys, see that? So you'll actually take, and I believe this receives a piece of aluminum that becomes the, um, I don't know, is like that called a strut? The frame, the frame. Yeah. yeah, that goes to the float. Same thing here, but this is also for the landing gear. And then of course this is where you plug in and then chase down the frame to go to your steerable water rudder. Now that being said, because this doesn't have thrust reverse, that is a big issue on water planes in my experience. Thrust reverse is huge, you can back up, if you're landing and you come close to reeds or something like that, or there's a lot of muck around the edge of a pond, you wanna be able to back up so you don't have to go through it to turn around. But also, it just helps to get positioned into the wind in my experience. So that being said, just a really, really detailed, look at these hinges even. This is just something that we're seeing more and more of on these planes, and just less and less of this, these little bumps. Mm -hmm. Really, really happy with the details. And these wings are gonna go onto this plane in minutes. Okay, so let's lay this aside and see if we've got everything out. I think that's all the major pieces. And then of course, we're gonna show you all the steps of assembling it here in just mere moments. But we have landing gear, I think, left. Yep. So if you think you got everything out, don't forget they're on the bottom. So we go ahead and flip this and show you what I'm talking about. See what I'm talking about? Yep, right there. So landing gear are taped in here. So you have to cut that free. And once you get that cut, then you can slide them out. Guess I didn't cut that very good. Now, to be honest, I was complaining about how hard these tires are, and that is totally true. But I gotta say, they look absolutely they gorgeous. Yeah. Very nice, but rock hard. Super hard. Rock hard, and really no excuse for that today's day and age. But at the same time, also we've got this raw foam here against plastic. Plastic is what you don't want to break. That goes in the wear and tear spots. Very resilient, very thick landing gear. These things are sturdy. And the camera crew here just a minute ago, Megan was mentioning something about how you don't wanna crash a big plane when it's new. Truth is, big planes generally are a little bit easier to fly. But with the stabilizers that we have today, um, and auto leveling, when you let go of the sticks, the plane levels itself, it's huge for beginners. And I just don't think there's as big a, an issue with getting a big plane because of a crash. Mm. I'm more concerned about the actual upfront cost of getting the plane, batterying the plane, and then of course, charging the batteries. That is true. So it, it, the other thing too is, I don't believe this is available in a ready to fly, but if it was available, please forgive me. 
But ready to fly planes are really nice for people that are still kind of testing the waters of RC. So if you guys are already in the hobby, you already know you're hooked, you know you're not going back anytime soon, then really it makes no sense to avoid a plane like this because it is amazing. So definitely excited to be bringing you another FMS plane. Now, obviously the build, look at the piece count. We do have a big bag. This thing we don't have to worry about. That's not gonna be used. So I'm not worried about that. There goes the cat chasing <laughs> that. We have two wing spars. We have a prop. We have a bag full of stuff. So that's four pieces. It's actually a group of pieces. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces plus the bag. That is Pretty really good. good. Yeah. <laughs> For a plane this size, that's like nothing. So let's just see how quick we can get this build done. Camera crew, what's the time count? 15 minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, so we're 15 minutes into this video. Let's see how fast we can get this thing together. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cheat and not use a plane stand. Okay. And here's why, because I want you guys to see just how quick and easy this build will go. I'm gonna lay this down. There's three screws. There's also what appears to be four and five screws here. Yeah, so a total of five screws. That is a very good machine style fit. I mean, look at that. That is really, really nice fit. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna break open the nut and bolt sack and see what we've got. Now we do have instructions that tell you how to do all this stuff. But here on Brian Phillips RC, we've done it so many times that many times we don't even look at the instructions. And it's not because we wanna show off our amazing skills of ignoring instructions. <laughs> Uh, but generally it makes for a better video because then I make lots of gaffes and mistakes and it's funny for you guys watching at home Unless you're following along then it's maybe not so funny. But anyway, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna dump this out Okay, so this is a nut and bolt sack. This is uh, probably what would be a pitot tube That's gonna go onto the wing here. We'll glue that on later and uh, Talking about piece count there's seven that goes to eight Here's nine uh, these are fences, wing fences. So, so what were we at? Nine, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay. okay. 15, 16, 17. Even if you counted all the little pieces, you're probably talking about 20, 30 pieces total. That is incredible. Yeah. Okay, so kudos to FMS for making these easy builds. They have not always been that way. Okay, now we have another, what is that one for? I wonder what that's for. I forget what that's for. It could be for floats, but I don't know for sure. So we're probably gonna have to be super careful and double check that we don't have a place that we're needing reinforcement. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this open. We're just gonna take a quick gander. Okay, so this, that goes to the spinner, that goes to the wing spars or not wing spars, but the uh, wing struts. Mm -hmm. This goes to the elevator or rudder, I can't remember which one. And then we have some screws. And of course these screws, I'm gonna throw these over there so that they're over there by our spinner. We have one, two, three, four short. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13. And then there's five of the shorts. Okay, so if you see this, the rule is going to be that they're long screws unless otherwise noted, okay? And they're short unless otherwise noted. Um, I'm guessing that one of these is gonna be used probably for the spinner, so we'll be grabbing that shortly. But for now, let's go ahead and get our vase of knot flowers. We're gonna have that ready to go, and let's get these landing gear in. The only reason I refer to the manual is so that I don't use the wrong screws because then that just gets to be in a real pain in the butt. Okay. Long screws to hold the wings in, clips on the wings. Looks like long on the top, short on the side. So three long and uh, looks like two short. So it looks like two millimeters probably is what we need. Yep, that's uh, two millimeter. And then we'll probably have one of each screw left over. Generally Definitely. speaking, we have one left over. All right, so folks, if you're new to this hobby and you're thinking to yourself, but Brian, I don't have room for planes in my house or my boat or my RV or my toy hauler or whatever it is that you keep your planes in, I'm gonna say this, that is one of the hardest things to work out with the, with the hobby. 
And that is as you grow and expand, which planes you have and which planes you love and which ones you want to keep together so they're ready to fly at a moment's notice like I have hundreds of, that has become one of the biggest problems I have right now in the hobby. It's just dealing with planes because there's so many of them. And I love these things. And I want to have all of them put together, ready to go with receivers. I don't want to be putting things back together. I don't want to be fixing things. I pretty much crash them. I fix them, put them away, ready to fly. And that way I don't have a lot of questions when I take them out in like six months and fly them again. But for you guys at home that are watching along here and you're new to the hobby and you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I wish I had 300. Well, just be careful what you wish for. <laughs> 300 is kind of a pain Not to deal with. But the thing is, if you've got, you know, five or 10, that's just the right amount, it's no big deal. And if you crash one, just remember, keep the parts in a big box. You're, you're always gonna need parts, believe me. And then when you have a crash, you can steal parts off of those planes as you go. That's one thing I've done for years and it's really served us well. And I'm not sure if I'm hitting the nut zert on this. It's harder to tell on the sides. Um, it is really difficult to tell if I'm getting that in there or not. Feels like I could be, but I just honestly, I can't tell. And then these longer screws, I've got definitely got good purchase here on all three. And remember, this is metal on metal with a nut zert behind it and plastic being pinched between the assembly. So in this case, I'm just not sure if it's going or not. It's kind of hard to tell. And to be honest, I'm not sure how necessary it is, to be honest. I'm sort of tempted to just not care. That's kind of what I was wondering. I almost feel like, are, am I sure they're short? Let's Where check the instructions. You, you know, maybe they aren't short. I'm not sure they are. Maybe that was just a, an optical illusion because they don't call out short ones there. No, but it does just say install the five screws as shown. Guys, I apologize. I'll switch you out for two. Yes. Okay, so now I have to tap this over on the side to try to get those out. And see, that's why I don't look at instructions because then I just get screwed up, right? You second guess what you probably would have done. Eh, that was just a gaffe on my part. So guys, here on Brian Phillips RC, we've been doing this for years. We have thousands of videos. If you're new to Brian Phillips RC, if for whatever reason this is your first time seeing one of our videos, the way we do this is we unbox the plane, we build it, we talk about it a little bit, we talk about the build, we talk about the um, quality of the workmanship, and then we just kind of show you the complaints we have, the gripes we have as we go along, and then of course we fly it for you on the maiden flight, which is always the one that's, you know, you're kind of working the bugs out and all that stuff. Every once in a blue moon, we'll have just a really terrible maiden flight because it's super windy or whatever. We might choose not to share that one, but it's pretty rare. Generally what you're seeing is our first time in the air with the plane and then we may fly it two or three times and then it goes pretty much into storage while we fly more new planes, which is crazy. And so when you see us flying, you're seeing the no BS first experience we have with it. And yes, we do fly in terrible weather. If you want to just show them outside while I fight mm -hmm. this one screw. Super it's, terrible. Yeah. This is actually like the least terrible that it's been in about Mm-hmm. And I'm going to pause while we get this out. So I finally worked that one out and um, I just had a hard time getting it started. So once you get it out, it should be pretty straightforward. If you put the right screw in the first time, it's always easier. And uh, I had a couple of guys ask me, why don't you use a drill or an impact to put the screws in? I've done that a couple of times. It's not like a terrible idea, except that you don't probably want to use the impact to actually torque down the screws because you will break the plastic more than likely. But it's really nice if you're alone, if you're just hanging out, listening to tunes, drinking your uh, beverage and hanging out with a family or whatever, uh, putting these things together is quite easy. And of course, now do it while you're filming and you'll run into every possible problem. Okay, so now the next thing they recommend, of course, is the wing, which is what I was gonna actually suggest we do the tail next, which okay. is what we're gonna do instead because there's no reason to have that wing on. The wing is huge. The wing is gonna make it really hard to flip upside down. And it does say to CA on all those fixtures, the wing fences and all that. So I guess now they are saying they want the uh, 10 millimeters back there. So those might be the shorter ones, I wonder. Okay. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense because it's going through a very thin insert. So yeah, so you do the horizontal stabilizer first, which is fairly easy. Of course, this ball link has not hooked anything. And so like I said earlier, that's gonna be for the elevator. So we'll put that on in a couple of minutes. And just to show you how easy this is, that slips in there. Plastic wraps all the way around the leading edge of that wing piece. And if you can, if you have trouble pushing here, you can grab in by lifting the elevator and then push that way. Makes it a little bit easier to get that in there. There it is. Now it's all the way in. And I can take these shorter 10 millimeter screws and get in here and tighten them until they're tight. And we're gonna do that for the left and the right side. Pretty straightforward stuff. And then of course we need to put the wing joiner in or the spar, whichever you wanna to refer to it as. It's fine with me, but this is gonna be what's gonna give you structural stability from the left to the right side on the horizontal stabilizer. Okay, so we'll just kind of work that through. Okay, very good. And then again, two millimeters on the drive for both this and the longer screws. So as you're doing assembly, you don't need anything more than just that two millimeter driver. Now that being said, there's also a tail light back here, very bright strobe, super cool, super realistic looking. And I love lights and I love the way they look on these planes. Definitely come to be something that's expected. And I found where this goes. That's what's gonna transfer the movement from the left side to the right side on the elevator. But I must say that didn't feel like it was giving me very good penetration. Let's see how far that's gonna reach. That's yeah, probably about right. Not very far actually. So we'll just slip that through. Probably a good idea to dry fit that for you guys at home. I'd kind of forgotten about that step. It's been a while since we built this. It has been. I love this plane though. It's a great plane, super fun, really striking in the air and uh, flies a little bit heavier than the Carbon Z, but I like it a lot. You don't have to install the wing fences by the way, but I would highly recommend you do. Anytime there's an actual control surface or detail like that, you gotta take advantage because it's just dang cool is what I think. Okay, so that's all the way through and just making sure that we have good purchase from left to right side and we have good strength being transferred back and forth. That's important. If you don't resolve it now, don't wait till later. It's gonna be a lot harder to figure out later. Like I said, just four screws. Now the cool thing is there's nothing that prevents you from taking this elevator apart. In fact, it's a pretty quick thing to take apart and look at how big this elevator is. Yeah. It's as big as the wingspan on some of our small planes. And to be honest with you, this tail is low. And so the vertical stabilizer doesn't go up very high over the back end of the plane. And that's good because some planes, the vertical stabilizer is up. That's and it true. about now it about doubles the height of the plane. Okay. So now if you guys want to look with me in here, there's a piece of tape that should be holding my uh, rudder cable, but it doesn't look like mine is still mm -hmm. attached. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to go in here and grab it and pull it up. So I don't know which one's which. It looks like this one's a light and this one's probably, um, I'm nervous about this because I don't know which one's which for sure. Okay, so there's two in here. One of them is going to the back as an LED and one is going to the back as the elevator. And then the other one that should be taped down is gonna be, of course, what was supposed to be used for my rudder. Now, the trouble is I don't see that, that wire. So if you guys look with me, I only see two wires. One is going to the LED, one is going to either the elevator or something else. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop this off. I'm gonna push this thing back right there, which is super nice. Then the canopy comes off or the windscreen comes off. Then you can see inside of here, we get all these cables. This is the flap, so that's not gonna be what we want. This one is the aileron, so that's not what we want. Oh, there's one that's going way back. 
that's flap, okay, not what we want. Then we have these still attached to something. Okay, that's the ESC. And then those uh, warnings are super prudent and very good idea for them to put them in there so they don't get sued as often. But I'm gonna go ahead and just immediately cut that off because it gets in my way. And I hate them. Those stupid warnings drive me nuts. But there again, don't cut yourself. All right, so I see this wire that's not plugged to anything. I'm trying to figure out what it is. I cannot figure out what it is. Dang. Okay, so that does make it kind of hard because all these cables are coming from the reflex and not from the actual control, control surface. So pretty hard to get back there and see what's going on. So I guess we're gonna have to get a little bit creative here and figure out if we can find a way to get that wire and we'll come right back. Okay, so we've got these holes on the bottom. My wire is evidently falling down, okay? So I can count one, two, and three right here. I'm just gonna show you guys, I don't know if you can see, there's one that's the LED, there's one that's mounted, and then there's one that's kind of loose. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually grab that wire here, and I'm gonna just make sure that I've got a hold of it. Okay, then I'm gonna tip the plane down, and I'm gonna actually try to get that to fall. Did it fall down yet? I can't see it yet okay. from here. So now I'm gonna take the plane and just shake it. Now this thing is slick, and I hope you guys don't have to do this. This will be probably the first time you've had to do this in a long time, but I can see it. Show them. You guys oh, see that? Oh, I think I see the shadow of it. Yep. The shadow? You should be able to see the connector. The connector is in there. So what I'm gonna do is now I'm gonna try to reach up there and grab it. And I don't know if I'll reach. It's definitely gonna be a challenge. So we'll get this and come right back. Okay, so with a little teamwork, we got that out of there. No big deal. Um, if that happens to you, these things can be slick. This one in particular is quite slick. So holding it is not easy. <laughs> it just wants to slip right out of your hand. So then what you'll do is you'll take your wire, plug it in, brown goes to brown, uh, yellow goes to yellow, and red is at the center, okay? And so this is the kind of retention clip that we see sometimes on these higher quality builds. Okay, so that'll keep that from undoing itself. And then just turn that steerable tail wheel. And I just wanna tuck this in. And we're just gonna have a couple screws on either side and then one that goes down. It might be one long screw that comes, actually I think it's just one long screw that goes through and then one screw that goes down. So we'll double check the instructions to verify. So that gets that taken care of. And that's supposed to be sticking out or should that have gotten Oops. tucked in? That was supposed to get tucked in. Okay, I will watch better next time. It's just that you're, re you're resting the weight on the plane. So you have to think about it because mine just swiveled out from under me. All right, so now we have to put a screw in you can see the nuts are it's over here. So that means I'm gonna be reaching through with a long screw here. And honestly, I'm not sure if I need a long screw or a short screw up here because I can't tell. So we'll have to refer to the instruction to verify that. Camera crew might look while I'm just tighten this up. Uh, screw in both spots. Okay. Which would make sense because I think we have one short for our leftover. That's pretty typical on an FMS build. Okay. And again, it's just holds true that you can take this plane apart pretty quick. And then obviously you'll want to tape down your rudder line if you would have to disconnect like that. Okay, so that's going in. And one thing you'll notice that's very good about FMS builds is that almost always do we have alignment. We don't have to fight much. Every once in a while you have a plane that's got four screws and you have to fight a little bit getting things lined up, but not very often. So that's very good. Okay, so now the wings, we could do the assembly on the ground and then put them on, or we could assemble them after. I think I'm gonna opt to assemble them after. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this thing has to go on, and so it is a lot harder to do it after the fact, so I'm gonna go ahead and line that up and just get that to kind of slide on there. Hmm, it's kind of fighting me. Why is it fighting me? acting kind of hard to get on there. 
Okay, so me and the camera crew are going to, she's gonna hold the plane while I push on this because I need more resistance to be able to get this on. There it goes. Okay, now I'm just gonna line this up. And even though I have that wing spar still kind of, or not wing spar, but I have the, uh, there it goes. And then just rock this back and forth. Okay, perfect. And then we're gonna get the wing joiner, which is right here. And as you can see, that thing can be put in before or after, but I just find it really easy to do it that way. And then Cam Crew is just gonna keep a hand on that end. We'll slide this through here. And I can also hold here. Looks like my decal was lifting a little bit there. Okay, so that's in. Then also be careful about pressing that into your skin because that carbon fiber hurts terribly if you get that into your skin. Mm -hmm. So be careful about that. I'm gonna go ahead and twist this. Because I don't wanna knock this down, I'm just gonna drop it back in place. And so far, if it weren't for that wire, pretty smooth, easy build. Got four screws left on this part. So I'm gonna have the camera crew hold the end of the wing so I can push against it. Perfect, that one was super easy. Okay. But I gotta actually get onto the spar first. Oh, Sorry. That's true. I'm holding it. Okay, so I've got it on the spar. I'm just pushing it. And just lining everything up. And slips right in. Now you gotta wiggle a little bit just to get those pins to align and then you're golden. So that is a quick build. Now, obviously we have a couple of loose ends to put together here. One, two, three, four screws. And then of course we've got these little pins. These pins are terrible, if I remember right. So if you find that you're having trouble with them, you may just opt to take them out and put a screw through. It's a very simple mechanism. So you would just thread through the plastic if you decided to do that. Or you can put it not on the inside. I prefer the toolless install and I tend not to take planes apart. Now this is one of those times where you have to pick a side, whether it's the front or the back. I'm gonna start with that side, the front in this case. Tighten the screw, and then I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna hold this plane and just close that gap. Show them up close right here. See this? That's gonna close the gap. Now, sometimes you have to get pretty aggressive to get that lined up, so I'm gonna have the camera crew hold right here so that I can do this. And Push then she's gonna stop it from moving, and I'm just pushing out here to make a lever, and then just tighten that in, and it goes in, no problem. Then, over here, kind of the same scenario, we're just gonna push this in and start, I'm gonna start at the front. Not that there's anything magical about that. You could start at the back, wherever you happen to be standing. Then once you get this thing screwed in, you could create lever and pressure against that front screw so that you can pry it into position and should be no problem. But if you're gonna be taking this apart, keep in mind it's not gonna be as hard to assemble the second, third, fourth, fifth times if you do have to take it apart because all these things will be in alignment, believe me. Okay, now hold this far side so I can push against you. Okay. okay, so once this is tight, okay, so we're good. So now the plane is built. Um, the only thing left would be accessory items, but they're cool accessories like the wing fences, the pitot tubes and all that stuff. So that's the next thing we're gonna put on. These things go onto the uh, actually onto the elevator, sort of the horizontal stabilizer, and they're labeled five and six evidently. So that's kind of strange. And then these are wing fences, and then these are antennas. They go up on top, they actually straddle this little pass through, so they go onto the actual wing spar. So if you try to put those in before the wing spar's in there, you can actually do that because there's a tube that's installed lengthwise. Okay, so let's leave this. Let's put the pitot tube on first. Um, I think I'm gonna be using mucilage today just because that's what I have lying here. Ooh, we actually do have some old Dynam China glue. Do you wanna use Dynam, Dynam China glue? See if there's an expiration date on it. Look, it's not even <laughs> open yet. Sweet, go. okay. So Dynam China glue. All right, so this should be pretty simple. We'll just uh, get a little bit on the penetrating parts and just maybe a little bit here and here. And this is a contact cement, so basically if you get it on the surface, then you wanna spread it in and around uh, the sticking areas, okay? And because that's getting pushed into the foam, essentially, should be real easy. And it'll just go right up in there and snap right into place. So that's pretty sweet. 
And if you want that to give you the best possible outcome, what you'll do is you'll actually take it out of what you just stuck it in and then let that glue set up for a few minutes, which is what we're gonna do for a minute. Now these are wing fences. Goodness gracious, they're slick wing fences, no less. And there is a correct way and an incorrect way. And I'm gonna just test until I get it right. Okay, so that looks pretty good to me. Let's see if this looks good. That looks pretty good to me. Now, CA would work really nice for this because you could just stick them in there and then CA around the joint. But again, I'm gonna go with what I've got on hand, which is right here and literally on hand, in hand in this case. I'm just gonna glue a little bit along there. Now this China glue is really strong and resilient and a little bit flexible, but it's not necessarily going to always be as good as using good old CA, which is like super glue, if you guys weren't already aware. And of course CA, if you use kicker, then you can have it set almost instantaneously and you'll get a little bit cleaner finish, but I do like the resiliency of this product, whether it be a China glue that comes from, you know, a model that you had built previously, or it's something else like mucilage or foam to foam. Our foam to foam just happens to be gone, so we've been waiting on that for months. And then we have mucilage, which looks like this, but it comes in the tube dry, so it's really frustrating sometimes if you get one that's dried out when you first purchase it, and that's really annoying. But there again, that's what you get with Hobby King is the occasional success story. So now I've wiped off the excess. And that is one thing you wanna do is, in my case, because I know I'm gonna be using this in just mere moments, I'm just gonna wipe that straight onto my next glue project. And then I'm probably gonna get a couple more of those. Q-tips are really handy for this type of thing because you can get in there and just clean it up perfectly in one swipe and just rotate to a clean spot and then you'll be good. Now, you don't have to take these parts apart, but you see, I took that apart. Now this is tacked up and it will go in there and probably never come apart. If I crash this plane tomorrow and destroy it, this thing will probably be stuck in the foam and the foam will rip out with it. I mean, that is a bit of a, you know, guess, but I've had it happen to me enough times that I can say it is not out of the realm of possibility. Okay, so just getting a little bit of glue on the edge. It doesn't need to be perfect, but the more perfect you get it, the better it's gonna look. And the less you have to clean up. So just sliding that on there, pushing that back. And again, you can pull those apart if you want the best possible results. But in this case, this China glue is great stuff. It's just, it's one of my favorite types of glue because it's easier to work with than CA and it's gonna hold up a little bit better in minor accidents, bumps and bruises. And that's also how they build these planes in China is they will assemble them with that contact adhesive. And so I tend to like that because it's as close to the manufacturer's specs as you can get even though they specify CA. Now I'm just doing exactly what I did earlier and I'm just wiping this edge. Of course, the camera crew is way back there so you probably can't see what I'm doing at all. If you look close on the inboard portion, grabbing a fresh Q-tip, we'll just wipe that. It makes a nice clean joint. Now, the other thing is with China glue, See, just a little bit of China glue there, is that this stuff will tend to seep out over time, whereas CA is one and done, you put it in, you're done. It's not a problem after that, and then you don't have to think about it again, which is very nice. Okay, so those are done. Now we gotta do the fences on the elevator. And the camera crew is desperately trying to figure out where I'm gonna go next. I'm gonna go there next. Okay. So. I've got two of these things, one says six, one says five. I have no idea what what means what. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do my best to make a value judgment. Now my value judgment is based on past experience having built this plane, so hopefully I get it right. <laughs> so if you look right here, there's two grooves cut out. Oh, okay. So I'm about 99% certain that what we're gonna have to do 
is we're just going to take our already dirtied tips, spread a little bit of that adhesive there. I'm going to lay it down on the other one. And all we have to do is just slide that in there vertically. And so the way that this works is quite simple. You don't come to Brian Phillips RC so you can see me put these things together more than likely. You're probably here for the radio setup and just kind of getting that help with uh, your first few times uh, dealing with computerized transmitters. That's a big part of what we do. Of course, we're gonna be doing that shortly. And if you guys have questions, you can leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. But I gotta say, it is very hard to keep up these days. We just have so much going on right now with footage. And I'm just gonna slide this up here and just slide it in. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out. And yes, that will make a mess of your hands, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, now if you get that stuff on a part of this plastic that you don't want to be coated in glue, there is a trick and the trick is to use kicker, which would be what you would use to accelerate your CA if you were using CA and that will clean this adhesive right off of there, but it will also diminish the strength of your paint. So if you do that, just keep in mind, you're gonna be doing it potentially to the detriment of the paint where you get that kicker. So just use your best judgment. So now I've stuck that in place. I'm gonna let it sit there while I cap off this glue bottle, this little China glue bottle. Of course, these things are really handy if you get models that come with that, keep them. Now I'm gonna pull this thing off. And you're like, I thought this was a build, Brian. Yes, it is. See, now that this is cooked off for a minute or so, I'm gonna slide that back in. Oh yeah, it's really sticky already. Okay, so that's on there good. And then we're gonna take, and uh, while that's setting up for a second, I'm gonna get a fresh Q-tip, a lot of extras on this one. And I'm just gonna go in here and just peel this off by rolling around the Q-tip. Okay, really simple. Then I'm gonna lower down and just verify we don't have glue all over it, which we don't. So we're pretty fortunate in that regard. So we'll jump over here, grab this. You can also roll that mucilage off sometimes and it'll just, just kind of wipe off if you're careful. But the easiest thing to do is to use kicker and it will break down the glue. Okay, so that's super tacky now. We'll stick it up in there and then we're just gonna grab that and then hit the edge. And we should be good now, so that basically that's the vast majority of the build. We do have to install this linkage here, and then that will just kind of do as part of our radio setup, of course. And then we have to, okay, we had cat attack going on there. We have to build the prop and spinner. So this is a pretty easy process. Now, this is a part of the build where you wanna kind of use your best judgment. If you aren't familiar with what what happens with planes and when things happen and how to keep yourself safe, this would be a good step to skip until the end. But because we're gonna mark the CG and for the sake of the video, we're gonna do it now and we're just gonna be extra careful. And we're gonna also share the precautions that we do along the way. Okay, so we've got our spinner. Our spinner has a screw that's gonna pass through here. And that screw is actually gonna go through the middle of this shaft and tighten this onto the front. But what's gonna hold the prop on the actual plane is this has an octagonal cutout on it. The back half of the spinner, just spin this until it bites in. Then you're gonna take this. Now, how do you know which way this goes forward? The print goes forward, meaning the print is readable from the front of the plane, okay? Then you're gonna spin this until it grooves in with a perfect fit. You're gonna take that washer and put it on, and then you're gonna take this nut and you're gonna put it on next. And so then you just finger tight that, and the next thing you need to do is grab yourself something like a crescent wrench. Of course, you can always use the right size tool, but I never have the right size tool, so I just use a sizable wrench, something like this, and just get that on there, and I just kind of turn it in and make sure I don't open that gap because if you open that gap, you won't be able to get your spinner to install. And this is sharp, so you'll note that it's kind of tries to cut you while you're doing this. Just imagine what it's gonna do if it's going hundreds of RPMs 
it's going to be dangerous. So just be aware of that. And you know that you're taking uh, your fingers into your own hands. <laughs> that was pretty bad. <laughs> that was terrible. So I think I need to actually walk this back. So I'm going to see if I can slip it. Yeah, that ain't happening. I want to show the people why this isn't working. Look, see this? Oh, that isn't seating because the leading edge of the wing is not going to allow that to fall down there. So I need to back off my prop a little bit. Sometimes this happens. It's very difficult to get that exactly right. Always just back it off just a hair. If I can get lucky enough to slide it, that's fine, but I don't think I'm going to get, Oh, there it goes. So I backed it off just a hair and we'll see if I can get lucky enough to put that on. Oh yeah. Look at that. Perfect fit guys. Absolutely gorgeous. Okay, so camera crew is going to catch that if it tries to fall. And in the meantime, I'm going to grab this. Did we have an extra short one? Yes. Where did. is it? Oh, Should there it is. Pile? There it is. I don't know if the short one goes. Ah, I'm pretty sure it's a long one. I don't think the short one will reach. Okay, so we use one of the long ones and just get that started. If it doesn't go, then I'll know that we need the short one. Okay, so now you'll notice that it's kind of wonky, wonked up the spinner. It'll either walk into place, yep, which it did, or you just kind of have to guide it at the last second. There it goes, now it's snapped on. So you see this? See how beautiful that was? See how easy and simple that was? And how absolutely amazing that looks? Okay, now the very last step, and this is gonna be the step that really ticks me off in the actual assembly is putting these clips on. I remember these clips were a real pain in the neck on the first one. And I'm gonna get myself in a position where I think I can go ahead and get these in. Now I remember the alignment, the alignment on these holes was not perfect. But I'm gonna to try to go on the front side of the wing. I feel like there's less chance of them coming out. And I also remember I had to use, maybe I had to use um, something like, oh, there, that one's in. That one's in. I feel like I'm kind of going the wrong direction right now. Can, can we mm. get the needle nose pliers there? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna use the needle nose pliers to put these in. I, I think they're probably supposed to go on the other side, but either way, I kind of like that they're not gonna fall out as easy. I mean, planes go upside down, it's dynamic loading, all that stuff. Things can come out of the top of the plane just like they can come out the bottom. But for practical purposes, generally speaking, things on the top of the plane don't get lost as easy as things that hang out of the bottom of the plane. Okay, so I'm gonna try this again. That was about a hundred times easier than I remember on the first one. Okay, so I'm gonna grab that shaft only, not the whole clip, and just slipped on me. Okay, I'm hanging on real tight. Get in there, you turd lover. So I'm gonna come up to this bend, see if I can guide it through, nope. And I know, I know why it's fighting me. It makes perfect sense because I should be coming in from the bottom. Let's just see for grins how hard it is to do from the bottom. Okay. So that's, that's in and that's in. That is quite mm. a bit easier. I should just do them both from the bottom. What do you think? It doesn't look as, I like it from the top the way it looks though. But oh, that really? was a lot easier. So let's show the people from the bottom. It's a lot easier. Just line it up with where the hole is. But see, now it's gonna be difficult for me. Yeah. Second, third, fourth, fifth times, usually a little bit easier. Oh, goodness gracious. Here we go. Let's see if we can get this. It's just an awkward angle, I can tell you that for sure. So again, like when you've got a plane that you're gonna take apart all the time, this is probably gonna be a bigger deal for you. But for me, I'm gonna put this together and probably never take it apart until I have to take it apart because I'm fixing it. But beyond that, this plane is basically built. Now, the, the time does not necessarily tell the tell because we had the wire that was not taped back there and yours will probably be taped back there. And as you can see, we had a really low tool count as well, which is really nice. Spares are right here. And then this, of course, is going to be used for the elevator here in a few minutes. But that's what we've come to find 
from FMS. They do a really great job of giving us easier builds than they would have to be from some other manufacturers. They do a lot of factory building for us, so we don't have to. And I prefer that. Some of you guys might like the kit mentality or the ARF mentality where you have to do a lot of the work yourself. And then you can like feel more comfortable with the plane, like you're not gonna make any mistakes or whatever. That's fine. But these plug and flies from FMS are actually almost like a hybrid between bind and fly and plug and fly because we have the addition of the stabilizer. So just keep in mind, they go really smooth. So now our next move for us is gonna be radio setup. So we're gonna come right back with that. All right, so we're gonna use the AR620 in this case. Now the 620 has an internal antenna. It's very small, it's very basic. It does super limited telemetry. So if you want more telemetry, you can go up to something higher, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because I don't think you need it. And in this case, if you wanna have packed telemetry without going to an Avian or a Smart ESC, I would suggest just same with this. Um, otherwise, what is it, the 6210 or something like that? It's, it's an odd size, we almost never use it. Mm -hmm. It's like the 8210, except 8220, that has telemetry but no AS Reax. They have one like that, but I almost never recommend it because it's just a weird middle size. I think these planes, when they come equipped with um, Reflex V2, then generally the AR620 is a perfect match because you have throttle, elevator, rudder, in no particular order, throttle, elevator, rudder, aileron, uh, flaps, and then mode. Now you don't have retracts. If you had retracts, you can actually change the mode from auto leveling to off to stabilize flight mode, and then you can unplug it and use that channel for something else, which is super cool on the reflex, and it will restore that mode every time it's energized. So really cool that you can do that. Now they recommend a 4,035C, but as you can see, my 4,006S, is a, it's seeing better days. Now I'm not saying that we can't use this, so we're going to plug this in right now, and I'm just gonna use the S2200. If you guys are new to the hobby, or you're just getting back into the hobby, this is kind of my go-to recommendation because you've got 200 watts, you've got two channels, and then if you're using smart technology, this only has one lead. And if you're new to the technology, you won't understand that that's a weird thing. But generally on a Gen 1 pack, which by the way, I already know this plane can handle A5000, you would have a balanced lead and then you would have a discharge lead. Now this also has the benefit of the data line, so you don't actually need the balance lead on a Gen 1, but on a Gen 2, you don't even have the balance lead because the balancing uh, ch circuit chip is actually a little bit faster, and so it's unnecessary according to Horizon or Spectrum, whoever you ask. Now that being said, this also comes with EC5 and EC3, which is really nice, built in. And then of course, if you have a non-smart battery, you can also charge it on these chargers, and that's part of the reason why I recommend these, because they are expensive, but they do pretty much all the stuff that we're talking about. And it's very nice that you plug it in and it just goes. You can also do your smart setup on your batteries, and you're like, what do you mean smart setup, Brian? I mean that these things have a chip in them, and the chips are actually going to allow you to set the automatic discharge timing. And so I set it to 240 hours. So when you're last charged, 240 hours later, I don't know if that means it hits the discharge level or it starts to discharge, but one way or another, it's gonna automatically discharge. And that's how you can get away with having tons of batteries and being as safe as you can be because it is really hard to remember to discharge batteries in my experience. I used to never do it and I lost every single battery and it was very expensive to not do it. So that being said, my time was even more expensive and so my choice was waste batteries if you have just four or five batteries, it's not that big a deal. You charge a battery, use your battery, come back, make sure it's at charge level or discharge level, which would be about 3.8 or in a smart batteries pack, uh, Gen 2 is usually about 3.9. You can also set the level to which it discharges to. So you can actually keep it higher than uh, 3.8 volts or 3.9 volts, and you could set it to four if you want. Or you could set it to discharge even lower. The problem is if you get too much lower, you're not gonna be able to recover the pack. It will eventually start to sag to nothing, okay? Then you're not gonna be able to recover that pack. Okay, all right, so we got a prop here. We need to be careful about that and be aware that it's gonna be spinning at some point. We wanna make sure everything is done right. So I'm gonna take this canopy off. We're just gonna look inside of this canopy. 
we've obviously got this to do too here in a few minutes. We got this to install and you can see that reflex from earlier. We talked about that real briefly, okay? We've also got this, which is an EC3, excuse me, EC5. So that is going to mate up perfectly with our IC5s. And that's what we've got on our 6S batteries. Now, interestingly enough, look at that 14 gauge wire, dinky wire yeah. for this configuration. So you've got a huge battery and then you've got a dinky lead going to it. So obviously in the manual, if you're in any doubt, the first thing you need to do is double check that you're using the right battery size. So this incidentally is also where the center of gravity is, which is 70 to 75, or I can get back to that shortly. But it does tell you at the beginning of the manual, there's also an insert for the reflex, okay? At the beginning of this battery, it's gonna tell you the specs on the battery recommendation. 22.2 volts, 4,035C. Now I know for a fact that you can fly on this a 5,000, no problem. You could even put a seven in, but I prefer the four or five. So it looks like one of ours is done. And before we actually mount our receiver, I'm gonna grab some of the shelf liner. Yes, I took shelf liner out of my drawers for you on YouTube. And then also I've got this double-sided tape, which we're gonna use, and that's gonna give us the ability to actually hood, uh, put our receiver down. But we don't have to do that because it's not spatially aware. The reflex is spatially aware. The receiver is just do a transmission and reception of data packets and replicating the stick conditions, okay? So in this case, this is a receiver, but it also transmits, just in case you guys were wondering. Um, and if it has telemetry, the more telemetry, it's still transmitter and receiver. But the primary purpose of this is a receiver, okay? This is also where we're gonna plug in our wires. It says BAT, then it says one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a bind button on there. You can also use a bind plug there, but I don't even know if anybody does that anymore. Um, and then if you'll look inside of here, we've got all these wires in the way here. Okay. And then we have this Velcro and then there's Velcro straps, real heavy duty Velcro straps. I'm going to undo one of them. These are the kind you like. Then I'll pull that off. I'm going to use this to make my battery retention. I'll probably use that spot because it looks like a good shape. Okay. And this stuff is like what you would use in your shelves so that the uh, spoons and forks don't come flying out every time your kids slam the drawers. So it works really nice. And all you have to do is you can also use Velcro onto your battery, but then you're stuck using one piece of Velcro on one battery and you always get it on the wrong side. And it just annoys me. Now I have done it before, believe me, but I just, every time I do it, I feel like I've cheapened myself and I, I don't like it. I feel empty inside when I'm done. And then I swear I'm never gonna do it again. <laughs> But for now, we're just gonna do this. Now, one thing, one drawback to doing this, and this is admitted, is that that, that adhesive will eventually eke out on a battery. And so you're gonna end up with batteries with a little bit of sticky stuff on the side. You can't clean that off, unlike Velcro, it's hard to clean off. I mean, you can't clean that off too by ripping it off the correct way. So I'm just gonna stick this back down and you're like, but Brian, what did you just do there? You took Velcro off, put a backing on it, and then stuck it back down. Why would you do that? Why would you just put the backing straight on the wood? Well, sometimes we have to do that. But this just works really easy, and then you get that extra thickness, and so it makes up. As soon as you tighten those straps, that battery is stuck where you put it, which is all you really are after. You're just after positioning the battery in such a way that it's not gonna be a problem for you as you're flying, because you don't want that battery shifting. That's, after all, how you make your center of gravity work out. You make your adjustment with your battery, generally. Now these are little vibration isolation, double-sided tape pieces, 3M and otherwise. And I use those to mount my receiver from time to time. But because this is not a spatially aware receiver, you don't actually technically have to do that. And I mentioned that earlier, but I think in this case, we'll come back to that if we need it. So I'll have that available and we got the receiver there. But our next move is to actually go ahead and set up the radio setup because we need to know what channel to plug what into where and how. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do for the radio setup part, turn on my radio, cancel them back, scroll to add new model, hide the screen from the uh, viewers so that I don't give anything away I'm not allowed to share, create a new acro, then this takes a while, the more models you have, the longer it takes, 
And while that's taking a long time, look how sweet this is. Look at those rivets. Mm -hmm. So yeah. cool. And then on the inside, we've oh, got yeah. the instrument cluster, which is super, super, super cool. All right, so then we can go to model type and model select we were just at. Model name, so this is 137 colon, and then we're gonna type beaver. Okay, so we have the beaver version two, two meter, okay? So then the aircraft type, this is where you set up your wing. So we're gonna do a one flap, one ailerons, and that just means one channel is controlling both ailerons, one channel is controlling the flaps. So if you were to set it up with flaperons or crow where the ailerons act as spoilerons and the flaps go down, which you could technically do, but you would need more channels, then you could go to something else like this, okay? Okay, and then normal tail, and then I'm just gonna go in here, select an image from a standard file. And I think we've got one that's like probably the carbon cub with wheels. Okay, now flight mode setup. We don't need flight modes on this model because what we're doing when we change between auto leveling, stabilization off, or excuse me, stabilizer off, and then auto leveling and stabilizer, <clears throat> that would be over here, except that we don't have a retract, so I can actually use here. So we're gonna have stabilizer on, auto leveling also on, stabilizer on. So we can actually set that up, but we're not gonna make flight modes necessarily but I guess we could, so let's just do it real quick. Flight modes are nice because then you can tie trims in with those two different positions. Now, I'm not gonna do that on this model because I don't think it's necessary. We generally find that you need to tie trims when you're doing full length flap runs or flap runs in general because they will change the flight performance quite a bit and then the trims are a little bit different for each mode. But inboard flaps, they don't seem to get real hokey when we change those. But we're gonna use this just so I can show you. It will give you a mode indication up on the main screen. So switch one, we're gonna assign to A. And see how it says two? Because there's only two positions. If I were to set it to switch D, then you would see it would say three. See how it says three? I'm gonna set it to switch A though, okay? And then, I don't know if I can name them here, don't care. I'm gonna just do it right here. So I'm gonna make it say what mode we're in. So it's really nice when I switch. So flight mode one is gonna be stabilizer. So cancel, cancel, and then we'll type in, I don't know if I wanna call it normal or just stabilizer. I think I'm gonna just say stabilized. Well, what do you think? I would normally say AS3X, it's not AS3X though. I think there is a voice call out for stabilized. Mm-hmm, that's true. Okay, so we'll type that in and come right back. Okay, so it says stabilized, but we might need to change the exact vernacular that we call out because now I wanna make it say something, which is gonna be way down here, except actually I don't know where it is because stabilized is different than AS3X, but they're kind of in the same area. So we'll just, ooh, like there's gyro initiated. That'd be one thing you could use. There's silence, okay, mix on. And so normally we just kind of scroll past this stuff. Oh. Do you see stability? Stability, oh, stability yeah, mode? I don't know, stability. stability mode might be okay, but I think we have stabilizer on or something like that. And then I could also just say, there's stability, that's another thing. <laughs> so this AS3X mode is normally what I would do, but I thought we had stability. Nope, we don't, so. The best next thing would be stabilize mode. Stabilize mode. Okay. So then now flight mode two, we'll change that name, cancel, cancel, clears it, and then we'll type in auto leveling. Okay, so this one says auto leveling. And so now I just need to find one that makes sense for that. This is the pre-selected sound choices, by the way, if I didn't mention that earlier. And there's a lot of them but it always seems like they kind of miss the mark on what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. pretty much almost always. Okay, let's see if we can find one. I think they have auto level. I know they have safe, but that's not what I wanna say because this isn't necessarily safe. 
Auto safety switch on, throttle gun, expo, okay. Pretty close. There's stabilization mode. There's attitude mode, which I guess you could see that. Mm. Stability, stu stability mode. Altitude hold. No, that's not what we have. Those self level. Okay. Okay. So now we know. Okay, cool. Now channel sign. The only reason we're going in and changing this is because we will use, uh, I don't think auxiliary two is gonna be associated to switch B because we're gonna use that for flaps. Okay, so now coming out of the main menu. Self-level, self-level, Which is really nice. So now we just need to make sure that the gear channel ends up being associated with our mode on our reflex, okay? So super easy in that regard. Now let's click, let's go. First thing we need to do is throttle cut is the safest thing to turn on first so you don't forget, whoops. So switch H. As you can see, it's working. Then we turn it off and now it's allowing us to have throttle. You can see on the little monitor down here. Okay, so throttle cut is on. And then flap system will make an assignment to switch B. You just highlight it and then move the switch you wanna have activate. So you can see it's going between these boxes here. This box outlines whichever mode we're in. And I wanna set this to two seconds. And I'm gonna do an elevator correction of like six. Whoa, sorry guys. To 10. And then one of them is gonna be minus and one's gonna be plus, but we never know which one's which. Now, part of the reason why we don't generally do this is because I wanna make sure that I have no elevator compensation or elevator correction when I first turn it on because I have to put this control rod in on the elevator. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that to be a function of having been incorrected or corrected even more elevator correction, okay? So we're gonna be mindful about that. Then we need to go into timer, and then gosh, what do we got for times on this? Do they tell us it how long? Tell us. They usually don't on FMS models. Yeah, it's a 60 amp ESC. Yeah, I would say we can get, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 minutes on this pack is my guess. Because if we fly on 5,000, we should get a pretty fair amount of time. One time is on. Let's just set it for five and we'll see what we get. Okay. At one minute, I want voice. At 20 seconds, I want nothing. Whoops. At 10 seconds, I want voice. And at expiration, I want tone and vibrate with a, a tone every minute thereafter. Okay, then we'll walk out. Then let's set dual rates and expo. Now this is gonna run alongside the stabilizers. So I'm gonna go like 5% at the top on the ailerons. Then I'm gonna do 10. You'll notice I'm doubling this amount each time. And then I'm gonna lower the rates. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna start taking off. If I don't have enough control authority, I'll go up. If I need less control authority, I'll go down. Okay, and that's what we're gonna copy for each of the three control axes. I'm gonna attach them all to one switch. Now you may say, well, why don't you separate them to separate switches so that you can make three different corrections while in flight. Well, that is one way to do it, but I found that that just creates too much pilot fatigue, meaning you're too busy doing too many different things and you won't have time to really handle any of it. So I suggest doing the half and double from a basis. And this has worked really well for me over the years. And so you take off, things are going good. You realize you need a little bit less expo. You go up here, you make that your new middle. And you pay attention to which axis was causing you trouble. And then you make that new assignment. So let's say you land. Well, then elevator is gonna become five. Well, then this would be five. And then that would be two. And then this one would be 10. 
okay? Or let's say you're flying along and you realize you need more, so this would become 20. So then this middle setting becomes 20. This becomes 40, probably 75% for the rates. And then this becomes something like half of that. So 10 with 100% rates still. So if that makes any sense, basically you want a halving and doubling effect. So half, double, okay? That's what I do at least. So throttle cuts on, go to monitor mode, throttles down, that's good. And then obviously we have our flaps parked all the way in regular flight mode. And it doesn't matter which mode we're in right now, but we'll go ahead and deal with that later. So now we know what everything is gonna be. So I've got my throttle cut on. Now I can start plugging things in. So this says aileron, elevator, rudder, gear, flap, auxiliary one, auxiliary two. So in our case, auxiliary two and auxiliary three would be channel seven and eight. So we're not gonna be tapping into those. If you were using a stabilized receiver, so like instead of an AR620, if you use an AR630, which gives you AS3X and safe, but still six channels, you get seventh and eighth channels to actually command master gain and modes. So you have full six channel pluggable, which is pretty cool. And then those additional channels will be available. Same thing with the AR637T, which is gonna give you the functionality to plug in a battery lead on the side or the top of the actual device and then you have to run it down with this little micro ph connector that comes back to the receiver that one's spatially aware too so in this case you don't actually have to even mount this receiver but i'll probably end up doing that so let's take a look at what we're going to do here so now we know what everything is where it plugs in and how it's supposed to be done so this says s bus ppm mode okay so that's going to be on for us this s bus slash ppm mode you could actually use an S bus receiver where everything gets channeled through this one plug. Um, and so I don't know if you could use one of the micro receivers and then get that done. We want to try that sometime, but for now we're just going to use this as the mode. Okay. So mode's going to go to gear. Gear is channel five in this case, and the Brown goes down. How do I know that? Because I've done this a million times, but if you didn't know, and you could actually turn this on its side and it would normally say it, but I'm actually not seeing it. Oh, there it is, really hard to see. It says minus plus S. So signal is yellow or white if it's Futaba. So like this one here, this ESC is white, red, and black. So black would be ground, red would be positive, and then white would be signal, okay? So on Hextronics JR, this would be signal, then positive voltage on red, and then brown would be your ground, okay? So now I'm gonna take this rudder. Rudder is channel four. Okay, so channel four is here. Not to be confused with the fourth set of pins. The first set of pins is actually the battery in input. And um, we're not gonna be using that particular plug because we're getting our power through channel one on our throttle input, okay? Okay, so this one's the aileron. So ailerons are plugged in on channel two. Okay, so here's ailerons. Now, if you guys are using a Futaba radio system, then you may notice that they're in a different order on your transmitter and receiver combo, but who cares? It doesn't really matter. It's just a preference issue at this point. And I'm just kind of being careful to make sure I untangle these wires as I go, and that makes it way easier to troubleshoot stuff later if you have an issue, which I'm not saying you will, but if you do, and it's bound to happen on RC planes, then you can deal with it a lot easier. And plus then your cables are a lot less messy. Okay, so this is flaps, but it's shorter, so I'll go to that one last. This one says throttle, and yes, throttle does pass through the actual reflex, which I always thought was a little weird, but it is the way that they've designed the system to work, okay? So that's also probably how they Make sure that it's safe because they can choose not to arm the ESC until such a time as you're safe. Sorry, camera crew. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the flap plug. So for flaps, and I hate where this ESC wire goes. That is a terrible spot for that. See, and this flap needs to go down. So that's gonna be on channel six. Now you'll notice that doesn't come from the reflex and that's because it's not a stabilized channel. So it could actually care less. That's just gonna go straight to the receiver. Okay, because you don't have a stabilizer attached to that part. Okay, now, sorry, I'm gonna try to slide this over mm -hmm. so I can avoid the kitchen faucet. Okay, so you see this, this wire, I hate the way that goes, but it's probably not gonna be 
a big deal because we're going to actually try to tuck this down. We're going to initiate things first by plugging in our battery in a safe way. We're going to have our throttle cut on and we're going to be prepared to bind. So I'm going to hit back, click, and then scroll down to bind, highlight, and I'm going to hit yes. And then it's going to be in the bind menu, but it's probably going to time out about the time I get my battery. So now you may have noticed I had two batteries charging. One is a 5006S 50C, but you could do it with a 30C for sure. I think you'd be fine on this plane. They call it a 35, but I'm gonna just do a 50 to be safe, okay? And as I suggested, it timed out, always does, okay? So now what I wanna do is I wanna lay this plane down in such a way that I can maximize my chance of being safe and minimize the chance of getting my arms sliced up, okay? Here, okay? So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna get my battery I'm gonna figure out where I kind of roughly expect it to go, and then I'm gonna kind of just put it in there, okay? Now, that's gonna make it harder to work with, getting all the wires mounted, but it's just kind of the nature of the beast. You gotta do something first. What came first, the chicken or the egg, camera crew? The chicken. Well, that's one way of looking How at it. How did the egg get here? Exactly. Should note that you didn't do that with the prop. Nope, I did that over there. Mm -hmm. I had an exploding wiener, mm -hmm. sprayed some burning, some fluid that caught, caught fire. on fire. Then I burned my arm simultaneously, ran it into the top of the counter and uh, or top of the cabinet and ripped and bruised. At the same so time. I got cut, burned and bruised and scraped. It was, it was hilarious. Kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so all, not a problem. All because you my wiener sprayed exploded. flammable fluid. It did. And I was, and I had other things on the on the oven. Yes. It was a very exciting moment. It was delicious in the end. Hmm. Yes. So anyway, getting back to the points. Now this is strapped in. You'll notice that that is, that is held in somewhat. Now I'm going to slide that around. Now my receivers just drop down loose. So I'm going to push that around the edge, pull that tight and just slide it along. And now if you just look in there, that battery's not going anywhere, nope. okay? If you crash and it shifts, don't be surprised. That's because you crashed. If you hit the ground really hard and get lucky and bounce or something like that, which I never do that, uh, then it's probably still not gonna move. You have to hit pretty hard for that to move. So now let's talk about how everything is gonna lay out. So this balance lead can come over to the side. We could actually plug in a um, proper voltage alarm. So now let's talk about this. Normally we would need to get to this so we can press this button, but only really the first time to bind it and then we can tuck it away. Yeah. But you'll see how my arms are. If that prop were to start, I would need to A, let the battery die, or the camera crew would help me. I would probably carefully take my hands away and do this, okay? Or I would, uh, then I would have to go change my drawers <laughs> and then we would come right back. But in this case, I'm just gonna not have that problem. So I'm gonna hold myself in a place where if that prop started spinning, I would have time to respond and I would be able to do so. Okay, so my throttle cuts on, but that doesn't mean much because it's not really bound yet. Now, for those of you that fly and set up your planes at the field, be careful. There's more than just you around. Somebody else could be binding at that moment. So just kind of do a quick glance up and down the flight line, see who's flying, see who's doing stuff. Make sure somebody isn't binding their plane and you end up getting cut because of their actions. Okay, so please be careful. Obviously the best and safest thing is to leave the props off. So I say that a lot because people give me trouble about it that have cut themselves. And everybody knows that in this hobby, there's basically two things that can happen to you. One, get cut by, by a prop, and two, have problems with fires from lipos. If, the, if people were burning their houses down frequently enough, believe me, we would not be allowed to have them. But it does happen and you need to be careful. So use some precautions, use some common sense, buy high quality stuff, give yourself the best chance of success and improve your odds. That doesn't mean that you'll never be part of the statistics, but it does mean that you need to be watching for those things and then take appropriate safety measures. Things that make you comfortable, like having fire extinguishers on the other side of that wall and over there and under the sink. I have three. Yes. We also have three exits that we can get to if we would get trapped by an exit, even though it's storming outside and crappy and everything. I wouldn't want to go out there because it's cold. 
But the reality is you have to think about your own safety and this is not nanny time. So you guys are big boys or girls, figure it out on your own. Just don't get hurt. Don't blame me if you do either. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna be pressing this button after we plug this in. You'll note that the prop won't start. That's normal, okay? I don't even have this in bind mode because I never seem to make it in time, okay? You can also turn this completely off and then whilst powering it, you could be holding this button to get into bind mode too. I just don't do that anymore for some reason. All right, so everybody understand? We're good. Safety first. Yes. All right, so plug it in. Note that the prop didn't start. Give it a second, make sure nothing's gonna change. You see a fast flash on the reflex. I am now controlling the plane with my left hand and I'm gonna press this button. Okay, now it's in bind mode. Now I'm gonna push the plane. I'm gonna safely move myself where I can control the plane and still give you guys a good view and control in case it would start taking off. Scroll down to bind, disconnect RF, binding. Okay, there we go. Now we're gonna wait. All right, so as you can see, the throttle's not on. And I'm gonna turn throttle cut off. And it's working, throttle cut's on. Now it's on and tested. Throttle cut's on and tested. That's the most critical throttle test you're gonna do in the build of a plane. And anytime you have to hug a plane to work on it, just like a plumber, you don't wanna get crap in your face. I don't know if that's what plumbers say. I just thought about that. They, they should though. Okay, so look at this. So you see this? I'm gonna pull that out of the way. Can I that's, my yes. Phone? Then I'm gonna slide this down. And I think what I wanna do is I kinda wanna just tuck this down in here because I can. And it should work out really nice because it's about the right size for that opening. The only thing I don't like about that is the fact that I can't see very well what I'm doing, not because of your flash, but because of the battery. Mm. So at this point, that's what we're gonna do until I have a chance to get this cleaned up. So let's clean it up real quick. That's why you guys come to watch these videos because you see how I did it. And then you can copy along at home. Okay. So we're gonna show you that next. Now, obviously we're safe, we're de-energized, I don't have to worry about getting chop sueyed. All right, so let's take this. Couple tricks. One, I used to use hot glue and glue along here. I've stopped doing that, why? Because it just didn't ever seem to do much of anything. And then when I crashed and things got unplugged, they unplugged just the same. Yeah. So. It's in the basement. It's, it's in the basement, it's a long ways away. That's true, totally. Okay, so I'm gonna just bundle that up. You see how I twisted that two, three times. And then look at that, guys. Look at that. I'll show the people. Show the people. I just stuffed it in the hole. Super nice. Yeah, looks nice. Looks neat, looks clean. Everything is settled in there. Now, if you guys don't know what I mean when I say a voltage alarm, a voltage alarm would be something that looks a little something like this, like this. And this is going to plug in absent some sort of a telemetry warning. You're like, what the heck happened to your pins? Well, I probably crashed it. Okay, now normally there'd be a push button here, but my push buttons broke off. You can change the voltage. So what I do is I use another piece of metal and I go in here and I need to buy a few more of these. I get like a bunch of them at a time and uh, I think we have links to them. So anyway, so that just shows the nominal voltage and each of the voltages of the individual cells. Now this is worth a grain of salt. It's not accurate. I have found that if you plug these in backward, polarity like that, which my buddy Esteban loves to do, <laughs> then it will destroy the electronics over time, especially on the larger packs. Mark my words. I think I have it set to 3.3 volts. You can change that. Okay, so if you want the alarm to be at 3.6, fine. 3.3, 3.6, whatever. Whatever meets your fancy. But the higher the voltage your alarm starts to go off, the more often it's going to annoy you with false alarms. But also the more often you're gonna know that you're low before you crash. So just think about it like this. If you're flying at EDF, 3.6 volts is a good time to start getting warnings because you need more time to allow that battery to recover and get out of throttle so that you can get your final circuit and get into a final land. Whereas with this plane, you could probably dead stick land it from just about any time, unless you're doing something crazy, okay? Just get your plug like this. Now, throttle stick is down, throttle cut is on. 
Be mindful of where your arms are. This is only our second test. Plugging it in, wait for initiation, control the plane, know what's happening. Keep all your fingers, okay? So we're good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and press this down here. Now there are certain planes that you have to be right up in its business. This is not the only plane like that, by the way. Most of them are like that. Nah, most of them are not this bad. Hmm. Some of them are this bad, okay? Carbon Z Cub is the same way. Elevator up, elevator down. Oh, it's not working, what's going on? Okay, first thing I'm gonna do before I go any further, throttle cut is definitely on and tested. I'm gonna clear my timer. Let's go ahead and get this rod stuck where it belongs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk around the back of the plane. We're gonna set this up on its cowl gently so we don't damage it. We're gonna look at the elevator and we're gonna see where it's centered with this little apparatus here. I'm gonna hold my fingers on there. I'm gonna hold my fingers on there. It looks pretty even, that's good. So the first thing I need to do is, oh, I need to check the manual. I think we go to the outside hole, but I need to verify that. Show them what I mean by the outside hole there, camera crew. Which hole it's gonna go in here, outside hole probably. And the control horn. Yep. I just have to check. It does show it to the outermost hole of the control horn, okay? Mm -hmm. One other question. Yes. You are not in a stabilized mode, right? No. Okay. And the only reason I can tell is because when I move this. Nothing. I am in stabilized mode. But I'm not in auto leveling that I can tell. It would be hard to tell right now though. So that's a fair question. So in order for me to answer that question, because I don't have it fully set up, I have to flip the plane upside down. Yep. Oh. Flip my gear switch. Flip your switch. Okay, so I just need to flip, flip your the direction switch. that my switch works, but that was a good catch. If you're in auto leveling mode and you're setting your elevator position like this, it's gonna be wrong when bad. you let it on the ground, okay? So, now that we're not in stabilized or auto leveling mode, I can just go ahead and center this, go to the outermost hole, slide this through, rotate it, and then what I want this to do is I wanna screw this out to where it's lined up like that, okay? And I need to go more. That's way out there. Okay, see that's, that's almost all the way out there, okay? So I'm nervous because I had on the J11's sister was the SU30, or excuse me, SU27. Mm -hmm. We had one of these yank out. So I'm gonna unscrew this all the way, just to be on the safe side. My thumb nail is protecting my point of reference. Oh, there's a lot of threads there. There's a lot of threads there, but I'm still not like thrilled about that. I'd really like to have more threads, but this is not an EDF jet either. It's not going 100 miles an hour you know, past us. The other thing too we could do is we could unscrew this and move it back one because look how much throw we have. Oh yeah, it's not moving that far. No. The problem is the geometry changes. If it's not there and it's back here, it's gonna change the way the elevator works. So I think I'm gonna have to throw caution to the wind on this one because I want that centered and I want this, when I'm pressing that in there tight, it's pushing it down right now. So I gotta go half a turn more. When I press that on there tight, it's right there in the middle, okay? So I have no gap here and I have no gap here, okay? You could also look here, but it's very hard to see because of that, mm -hmm. okay? So now I'm gonna use this tool, I'm gonna line that into the screw, and I'm gonna snap it on with this, okay? Then it goes on. And this is just a ball link tool, which is pretty cool. Elevator up, down, it's obviously backwards, so now let's talk about the direction of travel on these control surfaces. So coming around, camera crew. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and flip around this direction. Okay. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you guys the way I do it from my vantage point, which is gonna be over where I'm standing. I'll come around when you get set there. Okay. So now I'm gonna click, scroll the servo setup, travel, reverse. Okay, so elevator's backward. So I need to go to the elevator and flip it. Now that's up, that's down. 
Roll left, roll right, that is correct. Yaw left, yaw right, that is correct. Takeoff flaps, signing flaps are obviously backward. And we already know that gear needs to be switched. Mm -hmm. So now, stabilized mode. So then, okay. You notice there's no change there like you would if you were between AS3X and SAFE because they don't limit your bank angles the same way the AS3X does, okay? AS3X and SAFE work together. The Reflex V2 works similar, but not the same. Also, I note that we have a flashing LED on the wingtips. Mm -hmm. Again, not a fan of that. Not a fan of red in the rear. Red is right returning. Not an anti-crash beacon on the tail of a vehicle that I know of. I want that white. I want those solid. I do not like flashing nav lights. I don't care how cool it is. I want to see my plane. So I wouldn't mind having flashing landing lights. That'd be cool. But the thing is, I don't want flashing nav lights. Mm -hmm. So FMS, if you're listening. All right, so now flaps. I can either switch it here or I can just go into the flap mode and fix it here, which is what I'm going to do, okay? So I just pick the wrong direction and that happens. There's nothing you can do about it. You're just gonna throw the, throw the dice. Okay, so this is minus. I'm gonna go positive for that, for the takeoff flaps. And then I'm gonna go negative for this, okay? Okay, so now I've got takeoff flaps, landing flaps. That sounds terrible. What do we have going on there? Are we binding with something? Let's find out right now. Camera crew, let's give them a close shot. Right there? Mm-hmm. It's rubbing some rubbing. adhesive. So if you guys have that same problem, I'm gonna show you how to fix it right now. The easiest way to fix it would probably be to take a screwdriver, something like this that's kind of long, and you don't, I mean, there's a million ways to skin a cat, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close my, my flaps some, and just so I can get my screwdriver in there easier, and I'm just gonna basically open up by pushing down on that bottom part. Now watch this. So you get all the way at the bottom and you're starting to rub into it again, okay? So I'm just gonna keep doing that until I get to the point where it doesn't do that rubby noise anymore, okay? Can I go in there from this angle? Yes, I can. You could also take an X-Acto knife and score that foam. I can tell there's definitely a little bit of glue in there that it's running into. You could also put some uh, kicker on that and that kicker would rub that stuff off over the first few cycles. And you could change your speed from two seconds down to like full speed and then you could just run it back and forth like 50 times to clean that off. But in our case, we're not quite done on this, okay? So that's takeoff flaps, landing flaps. So the landing flaps, I want more deployment. And you're like, but you're already at minus 100, Brian, and you're already at plus 100. How are you gonna do that? Here's how you're gonna do that. Servo setup, travel, scooch over to, excuse me, to travel, go to flaps. Whichever mode you're in that you wanna change, you see how they're not lined up all the way here? Mm -hmm. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click into the menu like this. I'm gonna go up past 100. See how it's walking up? And we're at about 125. There's about 135. Okay, so now take off flaps, landing flaps. Now I'm in the landing flap setting. I'm just gonna go all the way down to 150, okay? And it does sound like some sort of a, you know, moaning animal, but that's okay, because I don't care because it's not that critical and it's just gonna wear itself down. Mm -hmm. So there's our landing flaps and then our takeoff flaps are gonna be here. And I'm gonna actually cut that back a little bit. So I'm gonna go down to flap system now. And just remember this scale is 100% of plus 100 by, by uh, stock setting or minus 100 on position two. Or in our case, minus 100 equates to minus 150. And in our case, plus 100 equates to plus 135. 
So it scales 135 to 150 minus, okay? So it's actually a grand total of not 300, which would be the max throw, but it would be like, what, 285? So there's 15 more. If you did it, you would go up past in your regular mm -hmm. flight mode. Okay. Now, also, I just wanted to say that's my takeoff, that's my landing, and they are in the correct orientation. Okay, so now if I want to change my takeoff setting, then I have to change this position. So I actually want that to be a higher than zero. So let's call it like 30. Okay, so it just barely deploys them. Okay, so there's our takeoff flaps, just enough to really kind of get us some extra lift with hardly any extra drag. And then the full barn door flap setting might do just a little bit more on takeoff. Let's do like, let's do 15, okay? So it's 100 down to 15. So that actually takes us instead to 100. That's gonna be 135 down to 15% over. So let's call that like, you know, 28 or something like that. And then zero, of course, is somewhere in the middle. And then down here would be minus 150. So there's a bigger step. So your neutral flight, your takeoff flaps, and then your landing flaps. There's a bigger step there. Now I found that that's really good in these planes. It doesn't always work out that way, but we'll see how it works. And the Fowler, the Fowler style means that there's this pass through here, okay? So it helps with the low speed performance and stall performance or short um, takeoff or landing. Now let's look at the ailerons. Roll left, roll right, and there is a little bit of a Fowler in there, which is really unusual, but cool also. Okay, so fast acting, elevator looks good. Nothing to write about, nothing to write home about. And then obviously what we need to do is just verify that we're centered. And then as you can see, that rudder's moving. Why is that rudder moving? Because that's the stabilizer. So watch it come toward me. Toward me is correct. A away from me or toward the camera crew is correct. Toward me, that's just trying to counter the environmental impact. When I go slow, it doesn't counter anything because it's too slow. Now watch this, elevator's gonna do the same thing. When I go up really fast, you're gonna see it go up, up, down, up, down. You can't see it from there, but I'll see if I can give you guys a shot right here. Okay, so just looking at this joint right here, I'm gonna go up, down. Very hard to see in this video. You may have to take my word for it. See if you can get a super up close shot of that while I do this. It's gonna be hard. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Hard to tell, I, I can see it in person. Yeah. But the thing is that's something you guys have to check. Now, ailerons. I'm gonna go up, up is up, down is down. Up is up, down is down. If you don't know how to test this yourself, give me the camera, I'll see if I can do it. It's hard to do this though. Okay, so we're following down the wing and you'll see how they're all lined up. Right here, they're lined up. Now when I lift the wing, here, can you come around my back and just see if you can hold it? This plane's just too big. Yeah, and when you can't. Okay, so now up is up, down is down. Up is up, down is down. Up is up, down is down. Okay, a little bit less jerky. Up is up, down is down. Up is up, okay. Hopefully you guys get the point. The whole idea is, what's happening is you want to see that surface go opposite what you're doing to the plane because you're obviously not using the stick to tell it to roll left or right. The plane is being moved by some external force called Brian Phillips, okay? So in this case, the stabilizer is countering the environmental impact like the wind or like the wind shear or you know, like the thermal activity that's coming off the top of the, the black building or whatever. So all the stabilizer is doing is countering the environmental impact that wasn't coming from you, but still giving you the opportunity to control the plane in addition to it controlling the plane, okay? Now auto leveling, this is how you test that. It's gonna try to level this plane so you can see that that elevator is pointed up. It's trying to bring that thing, the nose up until it gets to that point and then it's gonna be level. Now, what if you were pointed the other direction? Let's bring it to the edge of the table and show the people. So if you were pointed uphill, if you were letting go of the sticks, it's gonna try to bring that until it is about something like that. And it's just gonna fly flat and level. And then what else is it gonna do? It's gonna also fix your ailerons so that it tries to right your aircraft 
see this? So it's finding the quickest route to get it leveled. So right now it'd be this way. Well, what if the wind pushes you down past? Then it's gonna go that way, okay? Then once you get to a level, look at the elevator. The elevator's trying to level the aircraft. And then here it comes. Now it's nice and leveled and we're ready to rock and roll. So now that being said, when you go to take off, if you use auto leveling, you need to be a little bit careful because that can pull your nose up into the ground. It can, it usually doesn't, but it can. So just be aware of that. So also you'll notice that we did not end up using a double-sided tape because it was unnecessary in this application. And that's pretty, pretty common on these planes. When you have a reflex and you're using not a spatially aware receiver, there's really no reason to actually fix the receiver down. It's a little easier to move it into another plane too, should you need to do that at some point. But I can say right now, this plane is basically ready to fly. It just happens to be that it's really dark now. So elevator up, elevator down, roll left, roll right, yaw left, yaw right, steerable's working, steerable's working, we already know that. Takeoff flaps, landing flaps, Stabilizer on and off has worked. We have a little bit of a grindiness here when that linkage strokes on top of some glue, I think is what it is. But other than that, I'm really happy with everything. Super nice, uh, smooth movement on those wheels. But I can tell you this, when they're hard like that, they like to bounce. So in closing, this is a great plane. I know you're gonna like it, but we still have to check CG. And you're like, but Brian, why do you have to check CG? First of all, what is CG and why do we care? Well, CG is the center of gravity. Center of gravity, of course, is gonna be where the plane balances and that's where it's designed to balance, okay? Usually it's about two thirds, excuse me. Usually it's about one third to two fifths of the way back on the wing. But in our case, we know because the manual tells us it is on this page back here. And we said it earlier, but my apologies, it took me a while and I've now forgotten it. Right there. there it is, 70 to 75 millimeters back from the leading edge. So how do you measure 70 to 75 millimeters back? You're gonna take a caliper, you're gonna turn it on. If it's digital, go to 70 to 75. So it's 70 is the first one, and then 75 is the second one, okay? So just get close to 70. I can lock that down. Now I'm gonna flip this plane over. This is the time when you kind of think it makes sense to not have these in. Fortunately, they come out super easy. And you'll notice I almost hit my lights doing that. Is that gonna work? Can you just put a hand. a hand under this, please? Under it, yep. Got it. Okay, so then I take my calipers and a marker. Got the cap off of this marker. It's just a regular Sharpie, nothing special. We'll have that ready to rock. And then what I'm gonna do is you'll notice there's a taper in the wing, so I'm gonna come out to where the main part of the wing is. And I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna measure and note that it's right into this black, which is just not a great place to have to put a detent, but we're gonna do it anyway. And camera crew is gonna stay right where she is. And I'm gonna try to kind of be about the same. Yeah, just so it's easy to designate and feel for it. Okay, then I'm gonna go out to, what was the other one? 75. 75. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go to 75 millimeters which a five millimeter range is pretty dang small on a big plane. Mm -hmm. Usually you get about 10, okay? So you can see I made two big dents in there. And you're like, geez, Brian, that's so mean to your plane. Yes, I agree. But remember, if you get your CG right, your plane is gonna like you better. And you're gonna like your plane better, okay? So, why do we care about the CG? Because that's where the plane is gonna pivot and all you're doing when you use the elevator is you're inducing a pivot on that axis. So the center of gravity is not about weight. It's not about weight and balance, but it, I mean, it is sort of, that's how it fleshes out. But in practical reality, the reason we care about the center of gravity is because that is how we indicate where the plane is gonna pitch from. And that's an important concept. So if your battery is in a bad position, then you can adjust accordingly. Now, before I pick this up and get myself all chopped up, I'm gonna verify my throttle cuts on. Now I'm gonna get my head right down in it. I'm gonna center the pad of my middle finger on that. And that is pointed just slightly up. But you know what? 
This is a 5000 6S and it is into the firewall. So that's good enough for me and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to make that work. Now, if you need to, one other trick you can do is you can see that this battery, uh, maybe I could go just a, just a hair forward. Eh, probably not, it's there. Okay, I'm gonna mark this now. One line here and then one line, I can't draw the other line. So this is now 5,000 milliamp hour, 6S. 50C, and I'm gonna draw an arrow. And that arrow indicates what direction the lead comes out so that I can easily replicate what we did for our CG test. Now, why do I wanna do that? Because I don't wanna be testing this out in the cold. I just wanna set it up. I wanna go out there, I wanna fly this thing, enjoy the beauty and majesty of this beautiful beaver because who doesn't love to see a beaver and it just warms you up. But at the same time, I don't wanna go out there and freeze my tail off because it is cold right now. And uh, when I say cold, I mean like sub-zero potentially. So it could be very uncomfortable out there. But for us, we're still gonna keep filming in the terrible weather because we love doing this stuff for you at Brian Phillips RC. And we want you guys to know that we're here to stay. And if you wanna help support us, the best thing you can do is watch a video, smash the like button, subscribe, click the bell for notifications, the normal things you can do, doesn't require any money, just watch the videos. Then if you are in the mood to spend some money, and you will be when you start seeing these videos, buy these planes, not necessarily this particular plane. If you don't like this particular plane, if you're not into beavers, that's fine with me. I mean, that's, that's some people are like that. Then you can buy another awesome plane. And we have tons of different awesome plane footage that we have listed in our playlist here on Brian Phillips RC. But if you still can't sort through because you're like, good Lord, there's a lot of planes on there, then what you can do is you can go to our brianphillipsrc.com and we'll help you sort through by manufacturer and it might make it a little easier on you. And then it'll just link you back to YouTube. Also, that gives you an opportunity to buy. And if you're looking for the links to buy these, they're at the very top of the video description below. It'll show the plane. The receiver used, if it was a plug and fly or an R for bind and fly or anything like that, it's gonna be listed, if it's a bind and fly, it'll just show the plane. Then we're gonna show the battery we used or the one we recommend, or maybe a couple, maybe a couple of receivers, depends on the plane. And then we're gonna show the transmitter, and then we're gonna show everything else. At the very top of the everything else is Patreon and PayPal, and that is another place where you guys can support us financially. If you'd like to, maybe you can't buy this plane, you're between planes, your wife threatened to divorce you if you got another plane. So I mean, that's gonna be a terrible time. Um, make sure you get a big garage where you move to next. <laughs> but anyway, well, all I'm, all I'm gonna say is that's an alternative if you don't wanna buy a plane right now. And we understand everybody's going through seasons of life. And if you're just coming back into the season where you're buying a 2000 millimeter Beaver V2 from FMS, then check out the link in the video description below. You'll really be helping us a lot. If you got even an ounce of enjoyment or help from this video, you'll be really helping us. And it does actually add up quick and lots of people doing it makes this possible. Otherwise I would have been buried in the backyard by now. So that being said, beautiful plane, awesome stuff from FMS. We've had nothing but basically good luck from them except for a few linkages that were bad lately. Other than that, we've had actually really good luck yeah. with FMS. We we've have. had one or two duds, but we've had one or two duds from pretty much all the manufacturers, including the big ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end of the day, that's why you come to Brian Phillips RC is really not so much just so you can see the plane or hear a funny joke or whatever it is. Um, we're here to help support the hobby. We wanna get people into the hobby. We wanna get them into the right plane at the right time for the right reasons. And also give you guys some confidence that when you buy a five or $600 plane, by the time you put batteries in it, that's what you're gonna have into this. Um, you're not gonna be getting a piece of garbage because we have done expensive planes that are garbagey and they suck. And we have done cheap planes that are garbagey and suck. We've done cheap planes that are amazing and expensive planes that are amazing. It just depends. And everything online can be made to look amazing. But here on Brian Phillips RC, we don't hold any punches or we don't pull any punches. We don't hold back. We tell you the full truth because I'm a bad liar. And the thing is, at the end of the day, we want you guys to get a good plane that meets your needs. And everybody has different needs, make no mistake. You may have different needs in two years than you do right now as an RC pilot or you might actually be regressing as a pilot. 
um, and you just want something easier, your vision's getting worse as you age or whatever, you've had some health conditions that cause you to maybe not get out as frequently, so you need something easier. We understand it goes both ways and we're here to help you through that transition, but we hope that it's for the better, obviously. This is a great plane. I wouldn't recommend it as a trainer. It's just a little bit more than I think you should get as a trainer, in my opinion, but it is definitely an amazing flying plane. It looks good. It flies good. The only complaint we have with this plane is hard tires and stupid flashy LEDs. Why do we have flashy LEDs? I want my nav lights solid, guys. So other than that, we have flaps. Flaps are a big thing for me. We do have LEDs, big thing for me. Forward facing and rear facing is huge. That's what I need because it helps me in orientation. Also, this is not a jet that's gonna be going 90 miles an hour on final. It's not that big a deal to have the flashy lights on a slower operating plane. So maybe not such a big deal, but still my preference would be solid nav lights always. So that being said, guys, hopefully this information was helpful. One other thing too, some of our buddies in the RC community did have a motor blow off of this once. Give yourself a nice little pull on the motor. Make sure you don't have any loose mounts. We did that on our first one after we had uh, seen them have that epic failure. Stuff like that does happen. It's very frustrating. Uh, but at the same time, there's one, two, three screws. One, two, three. If you take that off, you do have to take off the prop. It's quite the thing to get down there and actually see the motor mounts. But if you would find that you have any looseness there, investigate. It's a good idea. Just make sure that thing's not going to come careening off while you're in flight because that's a real pain in the neck. Or if you take off and it's like, it sounds like a gas engine, you probably have something wrong. Stop, figure it out. Which is one of the things that we talk about on Brian Phillips RC. We don't hide behind manufacturer defects. We point them out. Which is ironic because then they want to keep doing business with us because we know that you guys are going to buy the best stuff and you're going to be able to understand the difference between a bad manufacturer and a good. The bad ones don't take care of you when there's a problem, which we've all been there. <laughs> Excuse me. And then there's the good manufacturers where you're gonna have high quality products that occasionally do have issues and they take care of you on it. And that's the difference. So we're here to help you guys sort through that. And on the World Wide Web, it's hard. So that being said, guys, NX8, it's been working wonderful. We've been telling people for a while, NX10 might be the way to go right now. We're thinking about that or the iX14, which seems like a big jump, but at the same time, I don't know what I want to do yet. Still haven't made up my mind. It's about <laughs> three months in, we're still thinking on it. NX8 has been great. We have three planes now that we ran out of channels on. One was an F16 with eight channels, plus two additional channels above for master gains and modes because it was an 8360T, I think. And then one was a P47 fun scale, just like the PT-19. Mm -hmm. Interestingly <laughs> enough, I like the PT-19 a lot better. But the P-47, we had to do without the master gain. We still got it made and got it flying and then basically never knew any better. So it's no big deal. But the thing is, having an extra two channels doesn't seem like a big deal until it's a big deal. And we're getting to the point now where I want full command and control of that master game when we're doing plug and flies or plug and plays that require that master game setup. It really helps tweak a system when it's brand new. Also, we are reluctant to go into the IX lineup because we feel like so many of you are coming to Brian Phillips RC for help with this. The most expensive and necessary tool, painfully expensive when you're brand new, you won't even remember you bought it in three planes, I promise. You will forget how much you spent on it and you will love it and you will never look back until you need more channels and then you'll be like, what the heck? So don't get the six, get at least the eight. And by the way, full disclosure, I use a bigger battery in here. That is an expensive battery. That's like a $50 battery, guys. So if you're gonna get this thing and 50 bucks is the difference between this and the 10, get the 10. Because it comes with the bigger battery. It also comes with Hall Effect sensors here. Plus you get two additional channels. So just keep that in mind. I still feel like the eight is gonna be plenty for most people but also the setup will be almost exactly the same. So just keep that in mind. You're not really giving up anything on the software side. If you go between the eight and the 10, you're just giving up a couple extra channels. Now the six does technically have that seventh channel, but it's not full. It's not a full, um, you know, proportional channel. It's just like an on off switch. 
but that works for like 90% of the applications because that channel is going to be used for gear or for safe on off or something like that. So just keep those things in mind. That's why you come to Brian Phillips RC because we're going to help you through the plethora of tactical details that you didn't even know were details or you didn't think about it until you did think about it. And then we helped you guys to come to a conclusion in your particular application. That's what we do here on Brown Phillips RC. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Stay tuned, there's so much more to come. And yes, definitely, if you're watching this around Christmas time, we keep everything up forever, so you probably aren't. But Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all those different things. There's lots of holidays around Christmas time, but that's what we celebrate, so we're gonna just congratulate you if you also celebrate them. If you celebrate something else, don't feel, feel like we're trying to neglect you, but that's what we celebrate. So guys, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's. NX8, amazing. FMS, good job. Stop flashing my lights. Give me some squeezy, squishy, soft tires. Like you did recently on another plane and it was awesome. So we'll be looking forward to more of that. And guys, signing out for tonight. Hopefully the Maiden will be one minute prior to this release and you guys can watch that right now if you haven't already seen it. And if you can't wait and you're just dying to see this beaver fly, we have other videos with squishies on our beavers from previous videos. But right now we want you to see the latest and greatest and this is the latest and greatest with a Reflex V2 and an AR620. So stay tuned, so much more from Brian Phillips RC.